Hey guys. Uh, so next up we have Dr. Joshua Freeman. Um, Dr. Freeman is a clinical microbiologist at Auckland City Hospital and an honorary academic at the University of Auckland School of Molecular Medicine and Pathology. He's also the clinical lead of Hand Hygiene New Zealand, member of NZMA's Specialist Council and a passionate critical thinker who has done a lot of advocacy around things like the TPP. Um, he was awarded the NZMA Fellowship in 2016, which was awarded to members who have, quote, uh, given service above and beyond normal duty to the NZMA, to the profession, and to the patient. So without further ado, I'd like to invite him to the floor. All right. Um, well, thank you very much um, for inviting me, uh, the organisers. Thank you so much. It really is a wonderful privilege. It's great to see so many people um, out here. I've been invited to do other talks before, but uh, sincerely, this was, uh, I was thrilled to be invited to, uh, to give this one uh, to you all. Now, that sounds a really academic, dry-sounding title. I'll try not to be too dry and academic, and uh, I'll try and get through things. Um, but it kind of has all the ingredients of what I want to cover. So I want to really um, extend our thinking beyond uh, of healthcare as more than just treating disease. Um, the, I want us to think about uh, population health, you'll be familiar with that concept, uh, in terms of the social econo and economic uh, determinants of health and health equity, and then I want to extend that even further into a concept of planetary health which has been introduced, and that's really looking at the role of natural systems and the natural environment in sustaining human health. The second part of the talk is um, kind of gets into the meat of things where I want to talk about the social responsibility of health professionals um, to advocate uh, for prioritisation of health and policy. Then I want to talk about some of the things we can actually do uh, that are reasonable and practical. And then I, probably the most important thing is I want to open it up for questions, um, comments and discussion. I'm going to be introducing some ideas that are a little bit controversial. By all means, poke holes in some of my arguments and thoughts. I'm keen to learn from you as well. So that's kind of an overview. Now, the, most of you will be familiar with the classic WHO definition of health. I just think we should start out with this as background. Health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Obviously the focus of a lot of what we do necessarily as health professionals focuses on uh, treating disease. but. Today I want to take a broader view, and I think we need to always keep that in mind as health professionals. Um, I also want to be focusing on population health. Um, just firstly a disclaimer, I'm not a public health physician, but I am passionate about population health. Uh, this is kind of my take on things, and uh, people like Scott, who is a real expert in this area, may be able to uh, refine some ideas or put me straight. But I think the basic idea is that population health aims to improve the health outcomes of the group of individuals, a population, as well as the distribution of health outcomes within the group. So inequalities in health within the group are of interest to population health. And I think there are two ways to kind of tackle this. You can have a preventative medicine-based approach or a determinants-based approach. And the preventative medicine-based approach is kind of like, think about rheumatic fever as an example. And a preventative medicine-based approach might be going into schools and trying to screen for people who are at risk and giving them antibiotics and that sort of thing. Whereas a determinants-based approach kind of goes upstream and looks a bit more deeply at what are the drivers for rheumatic fever and perhaps looks at crowding and household conditions and the socio-economic conditions that give rise to uh, rheumatic fever and a whole range of other uh, uh, um, uh, medical um, problems. So I want to focus on that second area, the determinants-based approach, which more and more, I think, uh, public health initiatives are leaning toward. So let's look at that. Uh, there's a classic uh, paper commissioned by the World Health Organization in the last, um, I think it's the last five um, years or so, uh, called Closing the Gap in a Generation. And I recommend you take a bit of a look at that. Uh, look at that. Um, this shows there's really a body of evidence indicating that health and well-being in societies are largely determined by the kind of economic and social conditions in which people are born, in which they grow, in which they live, they work and they age. 
And these conditions in turn are shaped by policies, decisions that are made at a political level that in many cases aren't traditionally considered associated with health or health care. So I want to take an extremely broad view of health and I think that's important that we do this um, and hopefully that will become clear uh, why I think that as, as this goes on. So I also want to introduce the idea of health equity. Many of you will be familiar with that. Um, and that is that um, the policies that shape the economic and social determinants of health can also lead to inequalities in health uh, within and between populations. And I think there's growing recognition in the sort of broader health uh, professional community that there's a real ethical importance um, associated with this concept of health equity. In other words, there, there should be a goal of eliminating inequalities in health that can be reasonably uh, avoided. There was also a, um, a uh, landmark paper brought out in the UK uh, looking at the um, determinants of health called Fair Society Healthy Lives. It's called the, also called the Marmot Review after Michael Marmot, and I recommend um, reading some of his, his work. He's former chair of the World Medical Association and, uh, and, and uh, 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 an accomplished um, uh, epidemiologist. So here are a few key messages from the review. It said, reducing health inequalities is a matter of fairness and social justice. So that's where the ethics comes in. This is, this is a matter uh, that, of ethical importance. In England, the many people who are currently dying prematurely each year as a result of health inequalities would otherwise have enjoyed in total between 1.3 and 2.5 million extra years of life. It points out there's a social gradient in health. The lower a person's social position, the worse his or her health action should focus on reducing this gradient. Health inequalities result from social inequalities. Action on health inequalities requires action across all the social determinants of health. And this, here's some data here which I think is really interesting. Um, looking at each one of these little dots represents a different um, neighbourhood in the UK. And down the bottom you can see, um, uh, sorry, up on the x-axis you can see um, the, uh, the, the age of, um, so well let's focus on the bottom curve there, that's disability free uh, life expectancy. And at the left hand side of the uh, x-axis you have the most deprived neighbourhoods and at the other end you have the least deprived, the most privileged. And you can see the difference in disability free life expectancy between the most deprived and the least deprived. If you were born into the most deprived, uh, you, you can expect sort of around 52 years of disability free life expectancy. If you're at the other end, uh, you can expect around about 70 years. So a huge difference. Um, and you've got to ask why um, that's the case. It goes a little bit further than that and that it this is another interesting piece of work uh, which goes a little bit further and uh, I would really recommend this book. It's a wonderful book by a couple of um, epidemiologists from the UK um, who basically summarised a lot of their peer-reviewed uh, work. What they found is that among OECD countries, among wealthy countries, um, the more unequal societies do worse, worse on a whole raft of... You, you might notice that the uh, y-axis has got the wrong... Um, it's got worse up the top, but uh, yeah, it, uh, it's worse up the top and, and better down the bottom, okay? <laughs> um, just for those of you who are very observant, um, someone else pointed that out to me last time I showed this slide. Um, so at the USA, they're doing very poorly on all the, um, on all the health and social problems, but it's a very unequal society. Um, and conversely, um, the sort of um, uh, Nordic countries and Japan do very well on a whole range of measures of ho health and social um, outcomes. And I think this is a quote from the authors, the big idea is that what matters in determining mortality and health in a society is less the overall wealth of the society, but more how evenly that wealth is distributed. Inequality provides a powerful policy lever on the psychological well-being of all of us. And I think those are really powerful ideas. Um, getting back to uh, Michael Marmot, along a similar vein, he points out that people with higher socioeconomic position in society have a greater array of life uh, chances and more opportunities to lead a flourishing life. The two are linked. The more favoured people are socially and economically, the better their health. This link between social conditions and health is not a footnote to the real concerns with health. 
health care and unhealthy behaviours, it should become the main fo focus. So it's certainly a, a shift in, in kind of perspective. And I think uh, while we need to be obviously focused on, on our immediate uh, responsibilities as, uh, to treat disease, we need to also have this broader focus. And some of us will be able to pursue it um, as, as a part of our, our jobs potentially. And uh, So the, the, uh, just, just quickly, the sort of um, recommendations that came out of this report in the UK uh, were, was six, six recommendations. So give every child the best start in life, enable all children, and young people and adults to maximise their capabilities and have control over their lives, great fair employment, good work for all. Uh, so these are very high level uh, uh, policy objectives, but uh, underneath that are a whole lot of concrete uh, policy recommendations uh, that could credibly uh, lead to these sorts of outcomes. So this is not just pie in the sky sort of stuff. This is, um, th this is stuff that can actually uh, be achievable. So I want to expand that even further and go into this idea of planetary health. So, you know, if you thought I hadn't gone far enough with expanding the idea of what health actually means, I think we need to go even further um, today. And the Lancet Medical Journal has actually just launched a new, a new uh, publication called The Lancet Planetary Health in recognition of the importance of this concept. So this aims to achieve the highest standard of health worldwide through attention to human systems, the political, economic and social, and also Earth's natural systems that define the environmental limits under which humanity can flourish. So that's kind of a, a definition of what uh, planetary health is all about and what it aims to achieve. Here's a sort of another kind of lead-in quote to the concept of planetary health. Uh, Today we live longer and more prosperous lives than ever before. It's true. The unparalleled public health, agricultural, industrial and technical advancements of the 20th century created the conditions for better health for billions of people. That's a good thing. Yet this tremendous socio-economic progress is taking a heavy toll on the Earth's natural systems. Our patterns of highly inequitable, inefficient and unsustainable resource consumption, together with population growth, are degrading nature in ways that are actually undermining our well-being. And I think it's recognition of that um, that's led to this... Uh, the launching of this um, new publication. So moving out and thinking about those environmental factors and what's happening, many of you will of course be uh, very aware of um, the issue of uh, climate change and where current policy settings are kind of taking us with uh, what we call, is often referred to as business as usual. And you see that even under, even under the commitments that we uh, have recently been made internationally, um, we're heading up to a very high degree of um, a, a very large temperature change um, in, in the coming decades, uh, well above the uh, internationally agreed limit. Um, this has been recognised by all the major institutions um, globally. Uh, this is a quote from a, a paper commissioned by the um, World Bank uh, several years ago. Uh, we're on track for a four degrees Celsius warmer world by century's end. Uh, many think that's a little conservative. Marked by extreme heat waves, declining global food stocks, loss of ecosystems and biodiversity and life-threatening sea level rise. Uh, as global warming approaches and exceeds two degrees, there's a risk of triggering non-linear tipping points. Uh, we are concerned, as the World Bank, that unless a world the world takes bold action now, a disastrously warming platen threatens to cut, put prosperity out of reach of millions and roll back decades of development. And obviously that's, you know, we're in an interconnected world and it has direct connections with the social and economic uh, determinants of health. I probably don't need to explain to you that a lot of the effects of climate change will be direct. There can be direct effects, there's also biologically mediated effects, but probably the most important are the ones that are sort of mediated socially through their effect on the sort of social determinants of health, the kind of economic and, and social uh, conditions under which we live and uh, that's been written at, at length and you can read about that in the Lancet Commission on Climate Change. And these different effects are likely to compound each other uh, and uh, to have a sort of a, a multiplicative effect. Um, there's also a strong ethical um, dimension to this whole issue. Um, up the top we have uh, the cunt, uh, sort of a distorted map of the world that's distorted according to uh, who, which uh, countries, which nations have been the biggest emitter of uh, greenhouse gases and have contributed the greatest to the problem. And you can see um, 
the areas there. Down the bottom, uh, you have the areas that will be most impacted, at least over the short term. So you can see that the uh, areas of the world that have contributed least to the problem are the ones that will be impacted the most, at least in the short term, and I think eventually we'll all be impacted because we're in a highly interconnected uh, world uh, and where we're very interdependent and, uh, you know, we can't... It's unavoidable. So, the key messages... the the. To kick off the new publication by The Lancet, there was a, um, a commission that was sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation, of all things, but that's great, it was uh, sponsored. Um, and they came up with four key messages, which I think are really, really cool. And, you know, um, you know, more and more you read these things and it's sounding more and more like a kind of radical uh, document, even though it's one of the world's most, uh, you know, uh, one of the world's most prestigious uh, medical journals. Uh, the con concept of planetary health is based on the understanding that human health and human civilization depend on flourishing natural systems and the wide stewardship of these natural systems. These natural systems are being degraded to an extent unprecedented in human history. Environmental threats to human health and human civilization will be characterized by surprise and uncertainties. Our societies face clear and potent dangers that require urgent and transformative actions to protect present and future generations. Um, the present systems of governance and organisation of human knowledge are inadequate to address the threats to planetary health. We call for improved governance to aid the integration of social, economic and environmental policies and for the creation, synthesis and application of interdisciplinary knowledge to strengthen planetary health. You can see this is all about recognising the interconnectedness of these different systems and problems and that we actually need to take this kind of broad overview approach to actually even begin to address these problems. And I think this is a real major step forward uh, conceptually to kind of begin to apply ourselves to this problem. We, you know, humans have enormous uh, talent when we're applying ourselves to the right questions and I think this is really about raising the right questions. Um, in that sense, I think it's a wonderful step forward, almost creating a, a discipline that sits above disciplines and pulls different disciplines together to try and uh, deal with some of the biggest issues we're facing. Uh, so solutions lie within reach. There's a positive message and should be based on the redefinition of prosperity to focus on the enhancement of quality of life and delivery of improved health for all, together with respect for the integrity of natural systems. This endeavour will necessitate that the societies address the drivers of environmental change uh, by promoting sustainable and equitable patterns of consumption, reducing population growth, and harnessing the power of technology for change. So some, some really big ideas there and some powerful, um, some, some, some powerful uh, goals. Uh, this has also been picked up by, by other authors a little earlier, as early as 2008. I think this is a great... Um, this is a great little paper, um, and, and I like this quote. Underlying determinants of health inequity, which we've already spoken about, and environmental change overlap substantially. They are signs of an economic system predicated on asymmetric growth and competition, shaped by market forces that mostly disregard health and environmental consequences rather than by values of fairness and support. So there's it's a values thing. It's about it's about ethics and values too. That's in the mix. It has to be. A shift is needed in priorities and economic development toward healthy forms of urbanisation, more efficient and renewable energy sources, and a sustainable and fairer food system. Global interconnectedness and interdependence enable the social and environmental determinants of health to be addressed in ways that will increase health equity, reduce poverty, and build societies that live within environmental limits. On top of that, there's an even cooler thing that got published by a guy, uh, by uh, two of the authors were actually New Zealanders, um, uh, Professor Rob Beaglehole um, and his um, um, and his wife. Sorry, I can't remember um, her, her name. Ruth Benita. Ruth Benita. So thank you very much, Scott. Yes. So those two um, uh, very accomplished Kiwi um, epidemiologists were, were co-authors in this and this wonderful piece of work. And I really recommend you you read this. But it's it's really quite a remarkable thing to be reading in the Lancet. Um, and, so, sorry, I'm, I've been reading to you a lot, but I think perhaps it's because I think, I think the thoughts of these people have, have far more authority than I do. So, so anyway, bear with me as I sort of read through this, because I really think it is worth, um, worth, worth uh, hearing. An urgent transformation is required in our values and our practices based on recognition of our interdependence and the interconnectedness of the risks we face. We need a new vision of cooperative and democratic action at all levels of society and a new principle of planetism and well-being for every person on this earth. 
a principle that asserts we must conserve, sustain and make resilient the planetary and human systems on which health depends by giving priority to the well-being of all. All too often governments make commitments but fail to act on them. Independent accountability is essential to ensure the monitoring and review of these commitments together with the appropriate remedial action. And this is the bit I really like. The voice of public health and medicine as the independent conscience of planetary health has a special part to play in achieving this vision. Together with empowered communities, we can confront entrenched interests and forces that jeopardise our future. A powerful social movement based on collective action at every level of society will deliver planetary health and at the same time support sustainable human development. So, you know, it, it really does sound pretty radical, but I think it just reflects the kind of times in which we live and the sort of uh, circumstances in which we actually find ourselves if we sort of look objectively at, at them, which is not always easy to do, I'll concede, and uh, sometimes it feels a little easier to sort of, uh, you know, just bury your head down and, and not sort of acknowledge these things. Um, but, uh, but I think I think we need to. So this is another way of kind of looking at it. We've got healthcare, um, the, looking at individual health problems and behaviour, which is what we're primarily focused on, and that's understandable, and we have to be focused on that. Um, of course, most of us will be working in that area. But there's sort of a step up, upstream, if you like, and that's looking at specific pop population health problems, and that's sort of the classic approach of, uh, of, of specific targeted preventative medicine programs, looking at reducing, uh, say, um, obesity or rheumatic fever or uh, um, diabetes and these sorts of things. And then looking, going even further upstream, when you start to look at the determinants of health, uh, you have to look at changing the actual, some of the structural uh, economic and social policies in our, in our societies. And that's where we come into planetary health and sort of this other area of, of population health. And we're thinking about, and, and at that level, I think, we need to be thinking about political engagement and advocacy to really gain any ground. And that's really what I want to kind of talk about briefly before we open it up. So I think just to summarise quickly, we've covered a lot of ground and a lot of big ideas, I know. Health and inequalities in health are largely determined by the social, economic and environmental conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age. And these conditions in turn are shaped by policies, often in domains that are not traditionally considered to be in any way related to health or health care. Um, there's a growing recognition that health inequalities are inherently unfair and ought to be addressed. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of ethical, the, the moral sort of element here. The concept of planetary health is a really big one. It recognises that these determinants of health are affected by the natural environment as well and that human health can only flourish within certain environmental limits. Um, and then Lastly, the global movement advocating for health equity and, the, and uh, climate stabilisation, those two kind of movements, uh, have an opportunity to come together under the common overarching agenda, this, this idea of planetary health. So what about health professionals and advocacy? Well, I'm going to give you six reasons that I can think of. These are just my, this is just my view. You can disagree with me. Um, there's plenty of room for dis disagree, uh, different views on this, of course. Um, you know, I, my feeling is that repeatedly treating people and then knowingly sending them back to the very conditions we know made them sick in the first place makes little sense. That's a paraphrase, actually, of Michael Marmot, but I agree with it uh, in, entirely. Secondly, fairness, justice and justice, I think, are, is a core ethical principle of health care. And I think this kind of, for me, this logically extends to the social, economic and environmental determinants of health. So if we are concerned about fairness, we should be concerned uh, about the evidence that shows that, uh, that these things shape this kind of gradients in health that we see within our societies. Um, if, and the third, I'd say, if health professionals won't advocate for the prioritisation of health, then who will? We're kind of uniquely qualified in society. I can't think of another group who's better placed to do it with more sort of authority, uh, both moral authority and some knowledge of what these, um, of, of what it's all about. I think in general, we're health professionals are relatively privileged people in societies, and that brings greater opportunities um, to influence policy than most people. And I think with opportunity comes responsibility, in a sort of once again in a kind of ethical moral sense. Um, 
Fifthly, I think the voice of health professionals is kind of needed to counterbalance power, other powerful voices that are out there in the media, uh, often with vested interests. It's not that they're not well-meaning, it's just often that the, it's hard to see the wood for the trees when you're very much focused on, when you have to sustain your, your business, your, uh, you know, your, uh, meet the demands of your shareholders. It's just the way our institutions have been set up. <coughs> Um, so when I think the voice of health professionals is needed as a counterbalancing um, uh, power there. And I think lastly, but most importantly, and hopefully it's, 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 I don't want this to be all doom and gloom at all, because I think the advocacy of health professionals can and does uh, make a difference and can change the conversation around these things. Well, it, it turns out that I'm not the only one that thinks this. A lot of people think this, and in fact it's come out in a lot of... Um, uh, publications and, and papers by different uh, medical bodies and health professional bodies. So the World Medical Association Statement of Health Promotion back in 1995 said, uh, obviously medical practitioners and their professional associations have an ethical duty and professional responsibility to act in the best interests of their patients at all times. And no one would disagree with that. And then secondly, and to integrate this responsibility with a broader concern for and involvement in promoting and assuring the health of the public. The New Zealand Medical Association Code of Ethics, doctors should accept a share of the profession's responsibility towards society in matters relating to the health and safety of the public, health promotion, education and legislation affecting the health or well-being of the community. Um, we'll skip to the bottom one. There was this, in 2006, the World Medical Association published a statement on the role of physicians in environmental issues. The effective practice of medicine increasingly requires that physicians and their professional associations turn their attention to environmental issues that have a bearing on the health of individuals and populations. Um, this is one, I think, another very important um, publication. I think when it came out, I think Scott and George and others did a nice publication in the New Zealand Medical Journal that I'd recommend um, highlighting this uh, statement by the World Medical Association. Um, it says, as a profession, physicians and their medical associations will encourage advocacy for environmental protection, reduction of greenhouse gas production, sustainable development and green adaptation practices within their communities, countries, regions, especially for the right of safe water and sewage disposal for all. Nextly, Physicians have obligations for the health and health care of individual patients. Once again, no one would disagree. And then the last part, important part for this talk, collectively, through their national medical associations and through world medical associations, they also have obligations and responsibilities for the health of all people. And um, I think I think particularly important there is collectively, because I think, I think, and that's what, what I want to emphasise, is this is about acting collectively, okay? If we try and tackle this individually, it's just overwhelming and it's just in, impossible. This is all about collective action. And uh, there are limits to what we can do individually. We you know we need to go on living our lives, but collectively we can contribute to some really powerful action, all by, doing a, by all of us doing just a little bit, okay? Other uh, eminent... Um, Players globally have made some pretty, pretty strong statements on this. This is from uh, Margaret Chan, um, Director General of the WHO. Addressing climate change is not just an issue of international agreements or economic costs. It is a choice of what kind of world we want to live in. Climate change is a price that we are paying for short-sighted policies. The pursuit of economic wealth took precedence over protection of the planet's ecological health and over the most vulnerable in society. Fundamentally, we are all facing a choice about values, improving lives, protecting the weakest, and fairness. These are the same values that motivate public health, and the health community is a willing partner in addressing this challenge. A very nice uh, quote, I think. And just to reiterate the Planetary Health Manifesto, that the voice of public health and medicine can be the independent conscience of planetary health, a special part to play in achieving this vision and talk about a powerful social movement based on collective action. So, all right, just quickly, I want to talk a little bit about my own personal experience, which is pretty limited and only goes back a couple of years, to be honest. I, I mean, I, when I was um, at your stage in my training, I mean, I was the least socially conscious. Uh, I was just, you know, out on my mountain bike. I didn't give a hoot about anything. I, you know, I was not involved in it. So you guys are way, way, way ahead of, you know, just by, by virtue of being here, which is fantastic, and it's what we, what we need. 
Um, so I'm a real late, a late starter with all of this. And uh, it was back in May 2014, I'd been reading a lot. Uh, for one reason or another, I'd found myself reading about, these th about this Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, as some of you may uh, know about that. Um, and, and, you know, once again, what does this have to do with health? Well, hopefully uh, we can see that there are ways in which this could affect the social determinants of health. It's basically a legally binding trade and investment agreement um, that uh, would affect, would kind of lock in policy settings and reduce the scope for future governments to kind of change policy settings with regard to a whole lot of um, areas that uh, where, where reform is needed in order to improve health. Um, and it would also um, have implications potentially for the affordability of medicines and therefore access to medicines by people uh, most in need, both within, within our country and more, more broadly. At the time, you know, public awareness was really poor, public debate was limited, discussion in the media was based largely on the premise that the agreement, without even any debate, that the agreement would be highly desirable for New Zealand and any threats to health were trivial and just unworthy of mention. That bothered me um, in, in light of what I knew. So my initial response was kind of to sit down and write a letter kind of expressing what I thought about all of this. Um, and I been calling for an independent health impact assessment of the agreement. I didn't really know what to do with the letter. Um, but I spoke to um, uh, the law professor Jane Kelsey, who some of you will know, I think is a, is, a, is, a, is a wonderful advocate. She's outside of the health profession, but she shares a lot of our concerns and, and, and values. Um, after some discussion with her, uh, we came up with the following idea. It was an ambitious idea at the time, and I was daunted by uh, the prospect of having to tackle this. But she, she said, well, look, we've got a week before there's um, going to be an opportunity for some parliamentary questions on this. In the next week, why don't we obtain as many signatures as possible from doctors and other health professionals throughout the country supporting the letter? Why don't you publish the open letter prominently in the Dominion Post? and uh, time publication to coincide with the next round of parliamentary questions and ask each signatory to no donate $20 toward publication. And, uh, you know, that seemed pretty ambitious for me. I had about five days to do it. She gave me the emails of a couple of other people she knew around the country that shared similar concerns. And I contacted colleagues uh, from Urutayo, the New Zealand Climate and Health Council, who I thought would have some interest in this, and the proposal was met with a lot of energy and enthusiasm. And over the next 24 hours, there was a flurry of activity. We sort of built up a network. People like Scott put me in touch with other people, and uh, a network was built up very quickly. And we had a whole lot of people with experience in different areas, much more experience than I did about these kind of campaigns and, and work. And it began, a kind, and this was all done via email, which was painful. You can imagine how many emails were flying back and forth. And, uh, but, you know, it kind of happened. Uh, somehow, over the next few days, it was a whirlwind of activity, but we jointly drafted a cover letter to colleagues explaining the issues, urging them to sign and donate toward publication. We generated a mailing list of colleagues that we thought were likely to support our initiative. Uh, we organised an online platform for donations. Uh, we organised the purchasing of the advertisement um, and drafted an accompanying opinion editorial for the Dominion Post and a media release and organised spokesperson. And all of these things were new things to me. Um, at the time. But the next few days were remarkable when we just, you had this new email address and it just kept on pinging as new doctors, from, as doctors and students, maybe even some of you from, from around the country, signed the letter and it just was pinging off every few seconds. And it was wonderful to see that. And a lot of eminent names came up. We, we were professors and deans of medical schools, heads of medicines, physicians, uh, well-known physicians throughout the country, really accomplished people. Uh, and it was amazing to see the support. And th this was a whole lot of people that were sitting around the country sharing similar concerns, but they weren't coming together. And it was wonderful to see how this could do that. By the end of the week, it was amazing. We'd raised roughly $7,000, and it was roughly 6000 required for the full-page advert. Uh, we published the letter the following Monday, along with the opinion editorial, and this kind of led to a cascade of different um, opportunities, television, radio interviews, um, as well as support uh, from the New Zealand Medical Students Association, thank you so much. That was, you were one of the key players in that early. You can see that you're one of the three logos up there in the, in the Dominion Post. Good on you, well done, thank you so much. And, um, and the New Zealand Medical Association came on board. 
uh, and the Association for Salaried Medical Specialists, so the union for the senior doctors. So there's a whole lot of uh, a whole lot happened after this. Very quickly, we formed a, a, a loose kind of group network called Doctors for Healthy Trade. Uh, we wrote a letter to the Lancet. It, we got signatures from all sorts of prominent people internationally. The chair of the uh, the Council of the World Medical Association, the uh, president-elect of the World Federation of Public Health Associations, and all sorts of internationally uh, recognised bigwigs in the area of globalisation health. We then had about over 12, I think we had probably more than that, opinion editorials in major New Zealand newspapers and other various other publications, and we got a whole lot of support from a whole lot of groups. And I think, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to overstate. Um, what we did, but I, I, I don't think it's exaggeration to say I think we switched the national conversation around this. Suddenly health and the TPP became an issue for people. It became, people started to understand it, particularly around the medicines um, issue, and, you know, and then some of the political parties came, came on board and recognised this as an issue. So I guess this is an example of how just a few, uh, j just some little things can lead to big things, and you can reach sort of tipping points, and that happens when just a few kind of ragtag docs from around the country who in their spare time are kind of like trying to work out how to, how to work together and do something. But it was very gratifying to see this. And, um, you know, um, and I think that was, that was kind of a, a wonderful experience to be part of. Anyway, so look, um, this is the last slide and then we can open it up. I think the key thing to say is the key is to organise and act collectively, okay? Because, um, you know, this is all about working together. So working through your uh, New Zealand Medical Students Association, working through the New Zealand Medical Association, the unions, you, when you become um, vocationally uh, qualified, then through your uh, colleges, all of these things, you can get involved and try and get those, those organisations to take strong stands, and this does make a difference. Not immediately, but it's the cumulative effect over time, and then you kind of hit these tipping points and things change. Um, I think you want to connect with and build networks with like-minded uh, colleagues, I think you want to support and join uh, health groups that are committed to this. I'd like to put in a plug, uh, a, sh a shameless plug for a group that I'm a member of called Oratayo, the New Zealand Climate and Health Council, and they're a great group um, to be a member. I think there's special rates for students, but you really need to, just the financial support is really important um, because you need people who can put in some dedicated time to, to give to this. So it would be great if you, could, uh, if you could manage to join that. That would be a major step in its own right. Um, get, get active, as I said, in all of these associations, and I think stay informed, start discussions with colleagues and friends about these issues. And it's not about us all becoming, uh, you know, um, devoting huge amounts of time to this, it's about us all doing a little bit and working together collectively and being smart about it. And that's, that's kind of all I think we can, uh, that, that's what I think we can reasonably do. Some of us may decide to go out and, and, and do an awful an awful lot and devote ourselves to this sort of thing, but um, that, that may not be what, what obviously what all of us are capable of. So look, I've, I've introduced a whole lot of big ideas some very quickly and a whole lot of perhaps, perhaps ideas that are a little bit controversial, um, ideas that you may or may not agree with, um, but I'm really keen to hear your views and, uh, and to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. It's a great question, and I think I think that in a nutshell, to be in this game, you've got to be a glass half full person. <laughs> you've got to say how far have we come from where we were, right? And there was a huge change. Nobody even thought 
the TPP was an issue. It wasn't. It was like, of course, it's a good thing for New Zealand. That was an assumption. It was a premise. It was unquestioned. We broke that question and we changed the conversation. That's a first step. I mean, we didn't. I, didn't, I mean, I would have been amazed if we'd um, if we'd actually held this thing completely at bay. But you can see all these things. I, I tell you, what, I learned a lot about politics in this process and the sort of strategic stuff that goes on. So, you know, and how little changes can lead to big changes. Okay, so. If you can um, make it a really hard, if you, if, say in New Zealand, we can make it really hard for our negotiators to make the compromises needed to finish the agreement and get it over the line. If we can make it really politically expensive for them to do that, that means these negotiations drag on yeah. and they drag on and they drag on and they drag on because they know we can't do that. It doesn't become an option. If they drag on, they drag on beyond things like the election in the US. So you can see how I think this sort of activism actually yeah. took things out and did have a role. Now, it went off the, it was off the radar for both political parties in the US. Yeah, I mean, it, my honest opinion, uh, my, my opinion, I'm going to be quite candid about this, is the Trump presidency is an absolute a disaster and his opposition to, um, to, um, to, to the TPP is on, 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 on quite different grounds to, to, the opposite, to the basis for our opposition. Um, but, and I think he exploited legitimate concerns in the population there, um, to be honest. But um, it, the point is, I think that uh, dragging that out had, had a role yeah. to play. And I guess the other thing is you don't really know what the national government was kind of saying and sort of compromising and standing for behind the closed door when they realised yeah. that New Zealand was concerned about these particular issues and how they were kind of... Exactly. Exactly right. It was a more benign. The, the endpoint was way more benign than it would have been otherwise as well. Even It didn't go through, but it was in a far more... Now, would that have happened without all the, the ruckus? I, I don't think so. Thanks for your presentation, Josh. I'm Carmen. I'm a TI in um, Really enjoyed sort of seeing your work throughout the recent years advocating on TPP. I'm just wondering what doctors and health are doing more recently um, the negotiations around the RCEP, like mm. things in Southeast Asia with the um, yeah. Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which mm. is similar along those lines mm. to free trade agreements. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, this is not just about the TPP. It's not just like well, every other trade agreement's been good in the TPP. No, there's been sort of a model and a template. So you're absolutely right, and that model is is continuing. Uh, the model is all about locking in kind of the kind of international policy arrangements of the last few decades. It's about sort of uh, creating, codifying it international into international law essentially and making it more difficult to bring about those reforms that we need to pursue the kind of planetary health agenda that I've been presenting. Um, so yes, all of those things are important. What is Dr. Fair Healthy Trade doing now? I, you know, to be really honest, I think I think everyone's pretty exhausted after a few years of a lot of work. My, my, uh, some of my key colleagues, I think, are, are very exhausted and having to catch up on a lot of things. Um, I've probably put myself a little bit in that category as well. Um, we have to uh, devote our energy to what's urgent. The RCEP's kind of boiling along, but it's not kind of close to kind of getting over the line, is my understanding at the moment. So um, we may have to intensify our action if that happens. Um, we really, and I think this is the thing, you really need fresh legs in this, you know, and it's like a rugby game, you need your, you need your bench to come on as well and to start working on these things and, uh, and so, you know, anybody that has some, some energy and time, um, you know, then we can fire up the doctors for healthy trade again, but we have been a little quiet lately, partly because things haven't been absolutely critical and partly because everyone's tired, that's a very, very honest answer. Thanks for all the brilliant work that you've been doing. Thank, thank you. It's very kind of you. Thank you. I just like you to talk about how um, global actors need to reach these goals of planetary health. Mm. I don't know much about the situation or very much, but how do we talk about declaring a state of emergency to help kind of focus resources and such? Is that yeah, I think all sorts of things have been raised. I can't, I can't really comment on the specifics of sort of the... But I think that's the sort of, I think that's the sort of language that's come through in a lot of the um, sort of the Lancet Commission, for example. And I think other people have, I'm not quite sure of the pathways for sort of an emergency, but I think people have described it that way. And it really is kind of a, 
an emergency unfold. Uh, yes, yes, actually there was a paper along those lines, I think, wasn't there, Scott? It was like, uh, in the British Medical Journal, I think, and it was said, um, calling um, climate change a global medical public health emergency or something along those lines. So you can probably probably Google that. It was in, in the BMJ. Uh, in the rest of the Tuesday. Yeah. Was it? A, a global medical emergency. Mm. Yeah. Through, through effective fear, uh, yeah, 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 that's right. And that's important to emphasise, of course, hopefully that came through, that this is kind of an opportunity to combine those two those two agendas to try and, yeah. The yeah. British Medical Journal had a paper reading Ebola first hit to the pandemic, and it compared all the responses that were being thrown by the entire global community of Ebola to climate change. Mm. Oh, yes, yes, that's, thank you, yeah, yeah, that's a good analogy. I mean, it's kind of unfolding in a slower motion, but it's, ultimately it's, um, it's, it's more concerning, yeah. Hi, um, um, thank you for your talk. Um, this is a particular interest of mine, um, but one of the things I think work with is um, trying to understand the parameters of these concepts. Um, and understand what, sorry? Oh, trying to um, come to terms with the parameters. That oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and... I've been uh, looking into global health a little bit this year, and often, so we can talk about planetary fear of health, there's global health, there's one health, there's international health, and I'm just wondering, are there parameters, and um, how do they... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great point, and I, you know, and I'm sort of working my way through that as well. I don't think that I've resolved those things, but listen, um, I think One Health is something that's bandied around a bit, and I think that's been a bit misappropriated. I think, in my view, um, I don't really like the the concept's good. The original concept's good, but the way it's used, it's used in a lot of ways that I think people, the, the meaning that people apply to it is a little different. I think that's my own view, um, mainly because issues around particularly antibiotic resistance, which is a particular interest of mine actually, and the sort of so, um, but putting that aside, I think, I think, yeah, this is a really expansive concept, right, planetary health, and I think it sort of it sits over everything, and it's kind of about just sort of setting the direction of the ship, and I think that's kind of the overarch, as far as I can see, that's the kind of overarching kind of uh, con concept that embraces all of these different things and brings them all together. Um, this is my view, and and then I think, you know, then it's a matter of kind of applying ourselves to that agenda, asking the right research questions, devoting ourselves to research in this area and advocacy, uh, and 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 trying to kind of applying all our talents, abilities, and powers of innovation to that. Um, so it is an expensive concept, but I think it's needed as a starting point, you know? Sometimes you say it's too expensive to be useful, but no, I think it's very, very useful.